Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All in. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Ten, nine. Ignition sequence start. Six. NASA is currently working to open up low Earth orbit to a number of private space companies. This will allow the space agency to focus on sending astronauts into deep space via new heavy lift rockets. America Space sat down with American spaceflight legend Tom Stafford to talk about his past experiences and his thoughts regarding this transitional period. Hello, my name is Jason Ryan, the editor at americaspace.com, and I'm very fortunate to be joined today by an American legend, General Thomas P. Stafford. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in Mar Annapolis, Maryland in 1952, and a year later he got his pilot wings. After that, he went on to become a pilot, instructor, and an astronaut. Now, we are very glad to have uh, General Stafford with us today. General Stafford, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Jason, particularly by my spacecraft. That's correct. If you'll notice, behind us is the, Gem actually, the actual Gemini capsule that Tom Stafford flew in his second mission to space in Gemini 9. I, I kind of wanted to start off with a little bit about, you were in the Air Force. Right. And the space program comes, comes roaring into, into the, the public consciousness. Now, when you're sitting there as an Air Force officer, what made you want to be a part of what NASA was doing at that time? Well, I always loved to fly, Jason. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And I wanted to fly the latest things to go higher and faster. Which I finally did go faster on Apollo 10. I didn't know what it would be then. but uh, So it was, it was a challenge and it was something that I really wanted to do. But from a fighter pilot, the next step to fly the latest and the fastest is a test pilot. Correct. So I, I volunteered and was selected, the group, to go to the Air Force Test Pilot School. Now, graduated with honors there and stayed on as an instructor and a test pilot. So you pretty much had done everything you could do at the Air Force and you said, what is the next thing? That, how, how can I go faster? And you see that we're launching people on ballistic missiles and that was for you. Right, well, you know, particularly when President Kennedy, after three weeks after Alan Shepard's flight, said, we're going to go to the moon. I said, that's for me. Now, you were, uh, you were joined, you were actually a member of the second group of astronauts selected right. in 1962, past the original Mercury 7. And you have a little bit of a, 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 little bit of a, a historical note there and a trivia question. Up until the space shuttle program, you flew back-to-back -back missions, or like only separated by five months, like I think 18, 19 days, on Gemini 6 and Gemini 9. Is right. That now, I can only imagine what the training was like for you on that. I mean, you must have, you must have not got any sleep. But remember, I was the back pilot for Gemini 3, the first Gemini 4. So we had two years to train for that. So I knew the Gemini systems. Exactly. Yes, so then, turned over after, then I flew Gemini 6. So I've been through two cycles. So turned around as commander. So when I, we had to take over after tragically when the Brian crew was killed in the plane crash. I told Sir, you just concentrate on the spacewalk. Mm -hmm. Work the computer over there, even though I can barely reach it. Uh, you know, particularly pressurized. So you just work the, the uh, EVA, and I'll take care of the spacewalk. Stafford flew with fellow astronaut Eugene Cernan on both Gemini 9 and Apollo 10. On Gemini 9, Cernan ran into some trouble outside of their spacecraft that put Stafford in a rather unenviable position, one which ironically was discussed just prior to launch. Stafford, however, handled the situation in typical astronaut fashion. It was very interesting. Uh, you know, we suited up, we had a couple of mobile homes put together, suit rooms over there on pad 60. And just before we suited up, well, we were in the process of suiting up. Gene was in one room with the tech, I was in another one. And Deke Slate walked in, pulled the tech out. 
1974. But then I had my suit on, got all zipped up, ready to put the helmet on. I said, Tom, he said, NASA management told me, has decided that the CERN and dies out there, because this is the first time I've ever gone around the world. I said, right. you've got to bring it back, because we can't afford to have a dead astronaut floating around in space. I looked at him and said, Dick, here we are about less than two hours before launch, and you're telling me this. I said, do you understand what all the ramifications? You know, there's no autopilot in this spacecraft. I had to fly the retro rockets by hand. It's all manual. All manual. And we did have a small end forward or, you know, blood end forward. But that was it until, you know, when we lined the platform. But we did all the maneuvers. We controlled it by hand and the retro. And, so, and I said, there's a huge mass on the 125 foot tether. I said, I don't know if I can control a retro fire. And then to bring it back in, the hatch has got to be cracked in it. And right here, it's 3,100 degrees. Here's my helmet. I have a, a suit, a nylon suit with a little pressure on it. I says, how long do you think I'll last in that? And it was the door that we, we, some part of G left, and then the drone chute comes out with all this mass, what's left there, in the mains. And I may make it, may not, but I do have an injection suit. But suppose we do all that, we splash down the hatch it. And the water comes in and says, remember Gus? I said, there's a capsule sign. Yeah. Now you're referring to there the uh, second Mercury flight on the morning. Right. So when Gus Christmas mm -hmm. landed, and for a long time he was vilified that you know, he, he pushed the button, it was late proof, there was no way he did it, it was an accident. Right. And his capsule sank, and they actually ended up recovering it, but uh, you know, it, was, it was a scary scenario. There you are with water weighted down. You don't want that to be basically the sequel of that. Yeah. So anyway, Dick said, well, what should I tell NASA? He said, Dick, you tell them I'm the commander when the bolts blow, when that chimney tighten, I'll make the decision. So this took quite a bit of time. CERN was always suited up. But, you know, we didn't have any calm between us as we went out in those days. So we flew in this little van over the pad, 19. We finally get plugged into the spacecraft. And he plugged in, Gene said, hey, Tom, what did Dick talk to you about so long? I said, Gino, he said he hoped we'd have a real good flight today. Now, at this point, you know, we were, this is the 1960s and most of the public was still using black and white television. Uh, fast forward a little bit to Apollo 10. This is the dry run before the actual lunar landing. And I gotta say that I was very impressed when I found out that you, you saw something that was planned on that flight that was a, using a black and white TV and you nixed it. You said, I want this. Why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about what you pushed to get on the Apollo 10 flight? <coughs> well, I'd flown two flights before, and it was, uh, you know, space is so beautiful, you look down at the Earth, and what you see, and all we had was Hasselblad film, and, and we did have little 16-millimeter uh, cameras, and, uh, but it, was, it wasn't just little short clips. I said, we, we ought to be able to do better than this. So I got with a group there, and. Uh, and I said, look, let's put together something. And so we got a low light level Vidicon from Vietnam declassified. We have lenses. Uh, there's only five in the world that are made in France. We got two somehow. And we didn't have time to get a color gun. You know, like regular TV has a, had a color gun, red, blue, and yes, sir. yellow. And so they went back to what the original TV was. They had a rotating disc. And they had a sink on it. It would sink in mission control of the rotating disc. So we put that color TV on Apollo 10 about a week before launch. And we had more prime color TV time on Apollo 10 than even did the 11th. <laughs> so uh, we, we won an Emmy for that. <laughs> yeah, I think it was very well deserved. I think the public really good to appreciate that. Well, you know, it was, it was a can-do attitude. said, so we've got to do it. This is it. Boom, boom, boom. Now there's a rumor about Apollo 10. I, I call it a rumor, but I'm going to have you confirm it. Uh, some of the higher ups at NASA were worried that you guys might actually try for a landing on well, it. What, you weren't even thinking about it. Now, is it true that they had the fuel kind of balanced so that if you tried to make a landing, you no. could make it? No, that's well, true. The descent module was full. The ascent module was offloaded. So, but, but anyway, the basic structure was too heavy. Oh, okay. And, um, and they gave Grumman in those days, which was a lot of money. I remember because of 
lunar module program got into trouble. They gave them $10,000 a pound for every pound they could carve out. And uh, Jason, that lunar module you've seen down here at the visitor center, they have one in Houston, was so thin, when it was unpressurized, you could take your thumb between the frames and push on the skin, it would blow out a little bit. And then the big rectangular door down there that you crawled out, we flew at five pounds per square inch when it was pressurized. First time I saw it was down here at the Cape in the altitude chamber. The door bowed out a little bit. The next time when it was around the moon, we pressurized. The door bowed out a little bit. So when you pressurize the capsule at full pressure, at, you know, PSI, that it actually was strong enough to make the door bend out? Yes, it just slowly, it, it bowed, you could see it bow out a little bit. And that was only a third of an atmosphere of pressure. Oh, man. It wasn't meant for commercial operations. Obviously. Uh -huh. <clears throat>